Thank you for listening to the Limitless Spirit Podcast. This is the conversation about faith, hope, and the impact we're designed to make as Christians on the world around us. Your host, Helen Todd, the Vice President of World Missions Alliance, has spent over two decades traveling to the world's hotspots to meet the spiritual and physical needs of those who are desperate. She interviews guests from different walks of life whose stories, books, and ideas examine today's most pressing issues and challenges of being a Christian today and inspire you to action. It was just a lot of fun. We get to do big, giant shows and do TV and all that kinds of stuff. It was just fun. We opened for Elvis when I was 17 in Hawaii. My friends were walking across the high school stage to get their diploma, and I was singing and dancing on the stage in Honolulu with Elvis. But then I got into drugs when I was um, maybe 19 years old, and I pretty much lost everything during those two years. And then I just was sitting there one day, and all of a sudden I had this thought, well, maybe God's real. And it was a revolutionary thought to me. The reason that thought was revolutionary to Warren Cook is that he was an atheist up until that point. I'm Helen Todd, and Warren is my guest today on this episode of the Limitless Spirit podcast. Warren Cook has an incredible story of being totally transformed by God from a selfish, drug-using tough guy to a gentle-hearted, loving pastor. He's the perfect person to kick off our new series here on the podcast, Changed Lives, Change Lives. Being touched by Christ is a radical transformation that is described as being born again. Even if it is not accompanied by a drastic change over lifestyle or your personality, it is a very powerful experience, and it also compels us to help others. In this interview, Warren shares how his success in the music industry led him to a very selfish, self-centered, empty life that eventually caused him to lose everything. And even though he did not believe in God, God was by his side and surrounded Warren with people who eventually led him to Christ. I'm excited to share with you who is Warren Cook after the encounter with Jesus, and what he does today to help others. Good morning, Pastor Warren. It is so wonderful to have you on the Limitless Spirit podcast. God bless you. Good morning, Helen. You're so sweet. It's so nice to talk to you. Well, I am very excited to share your story today. We are starting new series, and our our theme is Changed lives, change lives. And I'm sure you will agree with, with me. Once Jesus touched you, once Jesus, once Jesus changed your life completely, it is impossible to hold it to yourself. It is the nature of that change within you is you want to do the same for others. And so this is kind of the direction that our interview is going to take. So we'll dive right into it. So who was, today you're a pastor of Friendship Church in San Antonio, Texas, a a phenomenal spiritual leader, but who was Warren Cook before Jesus touched his life? I was a mess. I think probably more than most people. In fact, when I first became a Christian, the passage that I'm most related to was the woman who was caught in adultery. And then the other one, the woman that washed Jesus's feet with her hair and wiped, you know, with her tears and wiped them with her hair. And Jesus said, you know, leave her alone because the person that's forgiven much loves much. I was, it's kind of a long story. It's kind of hard. In fact, sometimes I start crying when I tell it. But, I mean, I was kind of raised in a pretty typical home. You know, it was a broken home. My mom and dad were divorced. I was on an orphanage for a while when I was little, for a year or so. Kind of kept to myself. I was a little bit shy. When I was young, I learned that I could sing and and, uh, started singing all over the place. And people were telling me I was going to be famous and all this kind of stuff. And it was kind of messed with my head a little bit. I didn't really want to be famous. I just liked to sing. But then I got into drugs when I was maybe 19 years old, and it just kind of accidentally happened. I always tell people, be careful who you hang out with, because the Bible says iron sharpens iron, right? That's good. 
He that walks with wise men, you know, he's going to be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. And I asked a friend of mine one day, hey, would you like to get together and let's start a club act? Just the two of us. And it was back in the days when Simon and Garfunkel and all those other two man acts were very big. And so I thought, well, that's going to be great. And he said, sure, come on over. Let's, I think that's a great idea. Let's do it. He was he was incredibly talented. But much to my surprise, he also was very heavily involved in drugs. And he said, hey, let's go get loaded. And I did. And for two years, I was never sober again. And I pretty much lost everything during those two years. Almost lost my life three times. Certainly lost all of my clean cut aspiring friends. And the bunch I ended up hanging out with later on wasn't the kind of folks you'd want to hang out with. Tell me a little bit more about your singing career. Your musical talent actually led you to sing with some pretty famous people. Well, yeah. When I was uh, 15 years old, again, it's kind of funny how God can deal in your life before you're even a Christian. I really think God had his hand on it. I accidentally interviewed for a group. In other words, I wasn't supposed to go this day that there was an audition, but my friends were going and I was too young to drive. So I had to ride with them. And when I got there, they said, Hey, would you like to audition? And I said, no, I just am here for the ride. They said, well, as long as you're here, why don't you audition? Well, it was a group called the young Americans. And back in those days, they were very, very popular. They just made a movie. They won an Academy award. They went all over the world singing and they interviewed, uh, auditioned 1500 kids that year. And of those, it's like every high school could send two, you know, their two best singers could go. So it represented thousands and thousands and thousands of young people that wanted to be in the group. And we went through five levels of auditions and I got called back and called back and called back. And finally, you know, they said, yes, you know, of the 50 that they took out of the 1500 that applied, I got in. I was the youngest singer in the group. And it was a song and dance group. So a lot of people in there, they played instruments. They were great dancers, ballerinas, actors, all kinds of things. All I could do was sing to the point that the first show that I ever did, we did it at the Dorothy Chandler Music Pavilion in Los Angeles, which is where at that time they held the Academy Awards. It's about three and a half thousand seat auditorium. And so what they did is they kind of snuck me on stage and I sat down, did a solo, and then they snuck me back off because I couldn't dance at all. I was there purely because of my voice. And so over the next four years, we got to perform with comedians like Bob Hope and Jack Benny and Milton Berle and my favorite, Red Skelton. Got to sing for two presidents, for Ronald Reagan and for Richard Nixon, and then also got to do a show, a live command performance for the King of Thailand. That was pretty fun. So we did all kinds of things. Open for Elvis when I was 17. So that was kind of fun. Wow. And all this at a very young age, that had to be very overwhelming for a young young person. Uh, actually, it was just fun. It, it was just a lot of fun. We get to do big, giant shows and do TV and all that kinds of stuff. It was just fun. What I didn't want, uh, between you and me again, I just didn't like what happens behind the scenes. You know, we during that time period, there was a lot of depression going on in the artistic community. I mean, Karen Carpenter was one of my favorite voices that ever existed. She died of anorexia, you know, just from depression. Elvis Presley, we opened for Elvis when I was 17 in Hawaii. My friends were walking across the high school stage to get their diploma, and I was singing and dancing on the stage in, in Honolulu with Elvis. But Elvis died, you know, alone, drugged, you know, so many people. It was behind the scenes. We opened one time, I won't name his name, I never will, but a very famous performer back in those days. He was older, he was married, and he was hitting on the girls in the group. And it just, it was just gross to me. Some of the things that I saw, I just, I didn't, I used to, um, she's passed away now, but I used to date a girl and she went on and she became very well known. She was one of Stevie Wonder's background singers. She was a black girl and I'm not black, I'm white, you know, but she was black and she went on saying with Stevie Wonder, her mama was one of the original Ray Charles background singers. And she used to tell me, you're going to be a big star and all that kind of thing. 
Well, for six months, I lived with her mama. My dad was a little bit prejudiced, and he said something about my girlfriend, and I got mad and moved out and slept in my car, and I ended up being taken in by my ex-girlfriend's mama. So I lived with her for six months and saw what it's like to be in that world where she would go on the road with Ray Charles and then come home and then just close the door and stay in her bedroom for two weeks with the blinds you know, drawn. And just it just it wasn't a healthy, happy life, you know. And then when I was about 21, you know, here here I'd been on drugs for about two years, but I still was a functioning human being. I had a job. I went into some computer work. And so I worked at this company and there was a man, he was about 40 ish, seemed, seemed really old back then, right? Really nice man. And he knew what I was doing. I had long hair and a ponytail and a beard. And, you know, I know I smelled, you know, from smoking marijuana all the way to work in the car every day. You know, surely they knew what I was doing, but he would just be so kind to me and so nice to me. And he was always the same every day. And I figured out he was a Christian. I even asked him something about the Bible, about, I don't know, something. And he he just kind of talked to me real nice. He never preached to me, never tried to get me to say the sinner's prayer. He just influenced me. And I've said for many, many years, when I get to heaven, I want to find him and tell him I've got here because of you. So at any rate, then later on, because of the drugs and things, I lost my job. I went through a really hard time time period. And then I just was sitting there one day. Again, I was raised in a home. We didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in God. I wasn't mad about it. I was just a nice, friendly atheist who thought God wasn't real, didn't make sense, wasn't logical. And all of a sudden, I had this thought, well, maybe God's real. And it was a revolutionary thought to me. And it led me, uh, make it short, to I started reading the Bible by myself for about six months. And I didn't understand it, but I read about this man, Jesus, in there. And I just wanted somehow to know God. I still didn't know that it was possible for me because I didn't call myself a sinner. I didn't use those terms back then, but I knew I was a mess. I was a wreck. I was a horrible person, I thought. And I knew a few Christians, but I always thought, well, I'm not like them. You know, Christians, those are good people, but I'm not a good person. And so I never thought to say, how did you get to be a good person? I just figured they came that way. You know, I didn't know about the life changing power of Jesus, even though all I was doing was reading the New Testament. And anyway, long story short, somebody led me to Christ. And then I ended up going to Bible school two weeks later. And here I am all these years later. So I heard you share this before that once you accepted Jesus into your life, you became a different person, not only in the terms of your lifestyle and how you lived your life, but even your personality from having a hardened heart, not being perhaps very compassionate or kind towards others of all the occupations, <laughs> you became a pastor, which requires a soft heart and, and compassion and understanding. So that was a change of personality. How would you describe that best? Absolutely. I always say before I got saved again, to look at me, you probably wouldn't have wanted me around. You know, back it was back in the old days in, in California. Most everybody I knew did drugs and we all had long hair and all that. But it wasn't just that. I mean, inside, I was just an empty, kind of a selfish, you know, I never thought of it being that way. But my rule was always kind of, if it doesn't hurt somebody, you know, it's okay. You know, so drugs, hey, it's okay. I'm not hurting anybody, you know. But really, I got to the point where pretty much everything that came out of my mouth was either a cuss word, because everybody cussed. It was just not, you know, it was just kind of culture. It was either a cuss word or a lie. And most of the time, I would just as soon fight somebody as sit and talk to him. I used to lift weights a lot. And I had a friend one time, and he was a pretty rough dude. And one time he looked at me and said, you think you're invincible, don't you? And I looked at him and said, try it and find out, man. I, I, I am. You know, I just had this. And, you know, the devil just puts all these horrible thoughts and characteristics in you. But when I got saved, man, I just 
had so much instantly. But what happened was I had a brother that wasn't a Christian. None of us were Christians. And he hurt his back. This is, again, how things just happen. He hurt his back and it, very, very badly. He was young. And then he went to a chiropractor and it helped him a lot. So he decided, I'm going to go to chiropractic school. So he left California, went to Arizona, and it turned out he just happened to get into one of the churches of the one of the finest pastors that ever lived, Tommy Barnett. And there he became saved. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, felt called to go to Bible school. So he went to Texas to go to Bible school. Well, then a year later, he came out to California where I was, and I was a mess. And he tried to tell me about Jesus. And I cussed him out and told him, if you tell me one more thing, I'm going to knock you out. He was a pretty big guy, but I was pretty mad. I didn't want to hear about all this stuff. You need to change and you need to grow up and blah, blah, blah. And I told him, leave me alone. Back up. I'm going to knock you out, buddy. So he left me alone, but he started praying for me. And he got all of his friends. He said, my brother's in trouble. Pray for him. And so they came back out a year later. And when they came out a year later, by then, everything had fallen apart. I had nothing to do. I was temporarily out of the music business. My friend and I had split up our little act. We weren't going anywhere. We, we frankly just did too much drugs to, to try very hard. But at any rate, he came back out, and I had nothing to do. And I thought, well, they're a choir. I'll at least go listen to them sing. And when I did... I got to talking to some of these young girls and they started saying, hey, you know, I said, hey, I'm reading the Bible, but I don't understand it. And da, da, da. they explained it to me. They led me to Christ. And I just was filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, I was saved. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, I felt power come over me and I just started to cry and cry. And I felt so much joy. And I suddenly was just in love with the with God, in love with Jesus, and in love with people. And they said, hey, come out to Dallas and visit us. And I prophesied. I didn't even know what I was doing. I was brand new in the Lord. They said, come out to Texas and see us. And I told them, I'll be there in two weeks. And they literally got on the bus in that parking lot of the church in Los Angeles and drove off January 14th, 1975. And I was standing there all by myself and saying to myself, why in the world would I tell them I'll be there in two weeks? I had no money. I had been robbing people. I've been stealing money because of drugs. I, I owed money all over the kingdom come. I had four bald tires and a flat spare. I thought, how am I going to get to Texas? What am I talking about? Why would I say I'll be there in two weeks? Well, lo and behold, in about a week, a friend of mine called. And again, this, he was not a godly person. He was a drug friend. And he called me and said, hey, Warren, I'm going to go to Fort Worth. Would you like to come with me? And I said, well, not really. I didn't like him that much. <laughs> being thought of being cooped up in a car with him for <laughs> driving all the way to Texas didn't sound very fun. <laughs> And uh, he, I said, well, is that anywhere near Dallas? He said, yeah, it's right down the road from Dallas. He said, I tell you what, I've got a brand new car. You help me drive out to see my uncle in Fort Worth, and I'll give you my brand new car to drive over to see your friends in, in Dallas. And then you stay there a couple of days, come back, pick me up. We'll drive back together. So lo and behold, we went out there, got to Fort Worth. He gave me the car. I drove to Dallas, stayed there a few days. And then he called and said, Warren, I've got a problem. I had an appendicitis attack. And so he said, I can't drive. I'm going to have to have a surgery, fly back, and you'll have to drive back by yourself. So stay as, listen to this, take my brand new car and stay there at that Bible school as long as you want to and come back home when you feel like it. Is that God or what? Wow. <laughs> I stayed there about two weeks with the people in the Bible school. And I said, why would I ever want to go home? All my friends are drug addicts. There, there's nothing I want but Jesus. I want to know God. And so I drove home, settled my affairs, turned around and went back to Bible school and been there, been going ever since. But yes, it, it, Jesus totally changed my personality. I mean, I used to be rough and tough. You know, I loved football. I loved every kind of sport. I turned on the TV one time after I got saved and there was a hockey game and these two guys started fighting which happens all the time at a hockey game. And I started crying. I was like, why is that guy being so ugly, so mean, so hateful for no reason? You know, I was just like, ah, oh. the Lord just, he put a spirit of compassion in me that I just love people. And seriously, 
I used to be a real kind of, even though I was a singer and I, I was even the president of that group, so I was respected by people, but I still inside, I was always a real loner, defending my little territory in my heart, I guess. But once I fell in love with Jesus, you know, the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit's love and the fruit of the Spirit's joy and its peace. And to this day, you know, I just, I want to do anything I can to help anybody I can. I want to do as much good as I can for as many people as I can. That's really what I live for. This is a very powerful transformation story. And just as you mentioned in the very beginning of the interview, to whom much is forgiven loves more. And so I can't help but think that having been transformed from you know, the lifestyle that was so destructive for you and and kept you miserable and lonely and headed in the wrong direction, you have the ability perhaps to emphasize or recognize that in people. And so I'm sure through your ministry as a pastor, even, you know, observing you on a mission trip to Serbia with WMA, you have the ability to reach out to certain people like perhaps no one else has. So do you have a story that you can share with us on this podcast of someone whom you helped to transform their life, just like Jesus did that for you? Paul says to rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. And uh, when I go into a room, I just continually, I can't help myself. I'm reading people's faces. I'm looking at their eyes. You know, I'm listening to the tone of their voice. I'm watching their their body. You know, are they standing up tall? Are they happy? You know, are they excited about something good that's going on? Or maybe is there something going on behind the scenes that they just need an encouraging word? Or, you know, the word says in in Proverbs, you know, a, a word spoken in due season, how good it is. You know, the Bible talks about in Proverbs 31, the godly woman that says in her tongue is the law of kindness. You know, so I'm just always looking for people that I can help and encourage and bless. Probably, and this maybe is a little bit different than what you're asking, but probably the one, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to reach out and help people, encourage people, pray for people, brag on them. You know, the Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due, you know, to lift people up because most people need it. You've got the devil that's beating on you and then just circumstances of life can really be rough. You know, Jesus said, be careful that the cares of life don't come and choke out the fruitfulness of the word in you. And so many people have so many cares they don't tell you about. And so I'm always looking for someone to brag on, to say something nice to, to encourage, to, like the word says, don't let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but only such a word as is good to edify people, to build people up. But probably the the one thing I think that meant the most to me over the years is a few years ago, there was a, a couple, I wouldn't call them elderly, but they're, they're getting that direction. And they've had a wonderful ministry in Latin America and in South America. And they oversaw about 35 churches in Nicaragua. And so they actually reached out to me one day and said, Pastor, would you be willing to take over our ministry in Nicaragua and oversee these 35 churches? Now, you can still pastor the church in San Antonio, but we're getting older. We want to retire, and we'd like to hand this over to you. Well, that would be a tremendous honor to, you know, suddenly have 35 pastors looking to you for leadership and, you know, encouragement and training and so on. But I didn't, in my spirit, really feel that it was what God was calling me to do. So I told them, I'll tell you what, I'll come down, I'll look at it, I'll pray about it, and uh, I'll do whatever the Lord, you know, shares with me to do. So I went down there, and when I was there, I noticed that their son, who was, you know, he's not a child. He's probably late 30s, 40s maybe when I went down there. I could see that he really loved the people, that he knew the language, he knew the culture, and the men, the pastors really respected him. And so I went to this couple, and I said, hey, you know, I prayed about this, and I really don't think I'm supposed to do it. I'd be willing to do it if God wanted me to, but I don't think I'm supposed to do it. I think God wants your son to do it. And they both just gave a big old sigh. And like they were like, like they were in, in unison. They went, oh, if only he would. And so long story short, I told them, well, I'm going to talk to him and pray. So you all pray. 
And the next day, one of our men from church was there with me, and the two of us got in a truck, and we had a two-hour drive, and we told him, listen, we feel like you're supposed to do this, and don't say no. Just listen to us. Let us tell you what we're thinking. We want to help you do this. I said, when you're in San Antonio, I'm the pastor. You report to me. But if I come down here, you're in charge. I report to you, and I'll help you. And he said, you know what? If you would do that, I'd do it. He said, I've wanted to do it for years, but I can't do it without help. And he said, everyone that comes down from America, they say they want to help me, but they really want to take over. He said, I need help. And so now here it is. It's been, oh, probably seven years or so. And now instead of 35 churches, it's about 50 churches. And it's grown to, you know, Cuba. And they, they, at any rate, it's just, it's just grown and grown. And I feel like God helped me to help someone else. And frankly, that's how I feel with y'all. I told you guys privately after I was there at the missions conference that I'm going to be praying that more and more pastors will entrust their people to you. You know, so many times pastors are nervous about other churches taking their people or teaching them something they don't want them to be taught or, you know, just somehow they're afraid to let people go. I remember Dr. Cho years ago, his church was successful, but not the massive church it eventually became. And the Lord spoke to him one day and said, you need to let my people go. And he said, why would you say that, Lord? That's what you said to Pharaoh. And the Lord told him, yes, you're a Pharaoh. You're trying to hold all of your people. You need to let them go. Let them grow up. Let them minister. And so I'm praying that, you know, I've looked at y'all's ministry, WMA, And everything you do from top to bottom is just excellent. It's so well organized, thought through, planned out. Everything is just run so well. And then the spirit of excellence and love and kindness that's in it as well. And then that focus of always wanting to reach people for Christ and then to build up the local churches in these other nations to partner with them. It's just so well done. So anyway, that's 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 kind of I'm just thankful we were able to help this gentleman down in uh, Latin America. And I hope that whatever we do can help WMA as well. Our people that have gone, I personally was tremendously blessed when I went on the trip. I didn't think it was something I was supposed to do because I'm a pastor. And so I thought, well, I've got my ministry here and I could just send some dollars to the missions field. But I found out that when I went, and actually I only went because my wife is like a little chihuahua. You know, if she wants to do something, there's no sense telling her no. She, she just keeps after me until I give in. And she really wanted me to go, and so I prayed and I went. When I got there, it was so wonderful to see how everybody that was there was, if I can use this word, it's not in a bad way, but everybody was exalted. Everybody got to step up. And everybody, I mean, it didn't matter if, you know, they they were a nurse or a doctor or a pastor or just a regular old person that had a regular old job. Every one of them, it's like they were transformed on the missions field to really step up into a different level of being used by God. And you just can't be used by God without feeling you know, that excitement, that joy, that purpose in life. I used to, to teach a lesson for years on how God said we're different parts of the body. One person's the hand, the eye, the foot, the ear, the whatever. And every part of that body is important. But I said, what if you were a nose? And what if the only thing you could do was smell, but you were always stopped up and you never got to smell a rose or smell fresh baked bread or something? Wouldn't you feel like life was empty? And so many Christians, they go to church year after year and they and they feel empty. Well, it's really not because the church isn't good enough. The preaching's not good enough. The choir doesn't sing good enough. It's because they're not using the gifts. They're not taking the opportunities that God's give them to use that, to let that anointing flow out of them to help somebody else. And you just see so much joy on that mission field. Wow, that was an incredibly powerful illustration, actually. I really appreciate that just sent my mind in so many directions. But another thing I was thinking as I was listening to you to part two, Warren Cook 2.0, if you will, (laughs) 
after transformation, you know, as you shared this story of how you encourage someone else in your place to become the leader and then you so graciously complimenting our ministry, I, I saw as such an example of the transformation that God has done in you because when you were in the world, in the flesh, so to speak, and, and you were so amazingly gifted and on your path to become a star, and, and that's the career that is all about you, where you are in the very center of your universe, you know, and and now, you know, as you're sharing about your life, after Christ transformed it, it's all about encouraging others, building up others, elevating others. That is the greatest example <laughs> in action of the transformation that the Lord has done in your life. And that was just really blessed my heart to listen to you. I am so thankful that God crossed uh, our paths with you and Julie and having been with you on the mission field and watching how you just continue to impact people, whether it's the fellow team members or the people on the mission field and how you lead the flock in your congregation in San Antonio. I can't help but just say thank you, Lord, for choosing him, drawing him to yourself and placing him in that position of ministry. Thank you, Helen. Thank you so much for this wonderful interview. And uh, I, I look forward to what the Lord has in the future for us. Amen. Same here. Has your life been changed by Jesus? If so, you have a story that needs to be shared because it has a powerful potential to help someone else. And while you don't have to travel half across the world to start changing lives, sometimes it is when you're away from your culture and outside of your comfort zone is when you suddenly remember how much you have been forgiven and how deeply you are in love with the one who changed your life. This is the beauty and the power of the Great Commission. If you want to learn more about going on a mission trip and fulfilling the Great Commission, you can find out more information on our website, rfwma.org. By the way, thank you for praying last week for the Greater Purpose Conference. It was absolutely incredible. We had just the most anointed worship, great speakers, and the time of fellowship that was just out of this world. You could still request uh, a digital copy of the Greater Purpose Conference. Just email us rfwma at rfwma.org and request a copy. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Limitless Spirit. I'm your host, Helen Todd. Until next time. Limitless Spirit is produced by World Missions Alliance. If you believe in the importance of the Great Commission, sharing Christ around the world and helping those in need, check out our website, rfwma.org. If you liked what you heard, consider supporting the Limitless Spirit podcast by going to rfwma.org slash give. Subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform and leave us a review. Tune in next week for another exciting episode.